Hello, so uh, I'm Sophie Valk, uh, and Chris will do the first uh, part of the, of the uh, I guess it will be a talk of uh, an hour and a half, and then we'll have a 10-minute break, and I'll go on for about an hour and a half. So maybe, Chris, you should, uh, am I sharing my screen now? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grab the screen if I, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, good. Now we see you. Soon. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Sophie, and thank you, Julian. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the first session this morning. Um, I had a good lunch or break or tea, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, the talk this morning was very good, I thought. Um, so this afternoon session is a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be talking about parallel programming in practice, scaling algorithms and, and coupling models. I'm mostly going to be talking about um, how we derive where the different algorithms come from and um, how we parallelize them. Um, this is not um, a course on parallel programming itself. That um, um, would be uh, probably an entire summer school in itself. Um, and I'm, so I'm not going to go through things like how to program API or OpenMP, for example, because in, in, a, in a session like this, there's not really time. Um, I can put up some resources, point you to some resources for how to do that if you're interested to learn more about the actual uh, programming models themselves. Um, but this is more about the algorithms and how they will scale for, for weather and, and, and climate models. So, okay, so let's get uh, let's get started. So, move to the the second slide, the end of the free lunch. So, as Simon was uh, explaining this morning, um, the um, the way supercomputers are built is changing. Um, and in the middle of my slide, uh, let's see if I can make you see the pointer. Can, hopefully, you can see the pointer. Um, so this 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 piece here, uh, it's actually a plot from Intel in the year 2000. Um, and what it shows is that um, if we kept just doing the same thing with our processors, which was to um, use Moore's law to double the number of transistors on an area of silicon every 18 months, and then just just decrease the clock speed to make it run faster, then the power density, which is what this plot is of. Um, uh, rapidly goes up at, at, at the junctions of the transistors. Um, and in fact, the silicon would get really, really hot. It would get hotter than a nuclear reactor uh, and get up towards uh, a rocket nozzle. And silicon actually melts between those two. So, um, so since 2005, there has been no faster computer. We've had bigger computers, computers with more processors, many more processors, many more parallel processors, but the clock speeds has not got any faster. So we can solve the, the power problem um, but um, by not increasing the clock speeds and instead of having more processes. However, we still have to use a heck of a lot of power in order to, in order to power these machines. So uh, in the top left here, this is a picture you've seen before this morning. It's of the Met Office uh, Cray XT40 supercomputer. Um, it has as many, this particular machine has quarter of a million uh, CPU cores in it, uh, and it consumes a huge three megawatt power supply. Um, in this photo here is uh, a, a peach which is partially obscured by the, the supercomputer below. But this gentleman here is Peter Kogi. He's an um, influential computer science in the US. And this was a paper at um, ISC 2015, where he was, uh, the paper was updating the energy model for future exascale systems. And it won the, the prize for the best paper. Basically, the, the, the premise of the paper is, is can you get can you get, can get an excess flop of computing using CPUs for less than 20 megawatts? And the answer is no, no, you can't. And 20 megawatts is a lot of power, and you can't have any more because there isn't any more. This is sort of a twist asking for some more. Um, and so instead of using CPUs, um, you want to use processes that have many more flops for the same amount of power. Um, and so you end up with a machine that looks a bit like Summit, uh, which is a GPU accelerator based machine. And the GPUs are much more parallel than the CPU. And you have to exploit all that parallelism um, in order to uh, not blow your power budget. But even so, Summit still uses a lot of power. It uses about 15 megawatts. And it itself does not yet do an exaflop. So 
Um, the end of the free lunch, the free lunch was not the lunch we just had, but the fact that you could just do nothing, buy a new computer, and your program would run faster, your model would be faster just by buying a new computer. Well, that free lunch has ended, and we now have to think about how we do parallelism much harder um, in order to get the performance that we need to run our models. So we're thinking about computation, how do we uh, um, compute, how do we compute something and our scientific innovation is in fact limited by the computation that we can do by both the size and the speed of the calculation. So the speed of the computation, we've kind of got to the end of um, Moore's law, depending on, what, on how you interpret that, but basically there is no faster computer. So if we cannot compute X and Y faster, can we compute X and Y at the same time, simultaneously or concurrently? So this is parallelism, doing multiple things at once. But then we have to think about the dependencies in the code. If Y depends on X, then we cannot compute them both at the same time. We have to compute X first and then Y. So this is why parallel programming is, is much harder. Um, it's not faster. You've got to think about actually how do we do that. And in fact, we have computing, competing demands on our computer power. Um, so here's a slide, uh, the, the graphic on the right over here um, is showing that different things we might do if we could do more computation. We could uh, increase the resolution. Um, that might give us a more accurate model. Uh, we could uh, run for longer or have more ensembles in our in uh, in, our, in our climate models. Um, that could also reduce the error. Uh, we could increase the complexity of our model. We could have um, uh, more physical prioritizations in. We could include the ocean. We could include the Earth system. Uh, all kinds of things we could put in make our models more sophisticated. But all those things take more power. And we can also process and include more observations. Uh, all these things um, uh, require an increase in computation, and so um, we have a finite amount of computation, and so we can always do better if we have, if we can do, if we can do the calculation better, if we can use a bigger computer, because the computer is not faster, it's now bigger. Bigger is not the same as faster. Okay, so what what kind of parallel? What is what is what is the parallelism we can do? Well, there's three main broad types of things we could do to do things in parallel. Um, the one of the most one of the ones that we do we already use in our models is um, is uh, data parallelism, and so um, this is the data is decomposed across parallel elements um, across different processes or processing nodes or whatever they are, so PEs, processing elements, um, and the different PEs can perform the same action on different data. Uh, so this is a single program, multiple data um, uh, paradigm of parallelism, and we might express that over the message passing interface library MPI, for example. Um, in this example, we include some data movement, and that's something called a halo exchange. So if we have four processes, P1, P2, P3, and P4, um, then we have part of the domain in P1 and P2, and then split across P3 and across P4, and we overlap them, um, these halos regions, so they appear both P3 and P4, so they can be updated by communication. And so the calculation of the different processes is not completely dependent, it relies on some on some uh, overlap between between the two. Um, so that's that's a form of data parallelism. That's something most uh, large models already do. Um, we might think about doing some task parallelism, so or also known as functional parallelism, where we decompose the problem into independent pieces and we do multiple things at once. And the pieces that we're doing are, um, they might not be completely independent of each other, but they are not the same task, so they're doing different things. Um, so we might think of um, coupled models. Um, Sophie will talk a lot more about coupling um, in, in the session after me. Um, we'll talk, um, so in this particular example, this is a, a diagram taken from the Met Office Unified Model. Um, and so this couples together, for example, uh, the Ocean, which is a separate computer program model running with the UM Atmosphere model, and they get they exchange information via the coupler. Um, so this is task parallelism. So you have some of your processes running the Ocean, some of them running the Atmosphere, and some of them doing the coupling. Um, and we can also do multiple things in the atmosphere as well. So we have the land surface and chemistry. We have to do I/O, uh, the and the ocean and cryosphere. We also have to take a cap of the sea ice, 
that also has the do IO, so that has its own IO server as well. Um, uh, IO server itself, asynchronous offloaders data, that, that's uh, doing things task parallelism, um, ensembles, if we do many models of unperturbed data, those are quite weakly coupled, but they are still uh, doing things in parallel. So this is task parallelism. There's a number of ways we can do things, multiple things at once. Um, that's a, a quite coarse grain level of parallelism. We can, of course, do things in a much finer coarse le grain level of parallelism as well within a particular program. We might think about trying to run things on the CPU and the GPU um, with some kind of kernel offload, um, and that would could also be task parallelism. So and there is levels of levels of different parallelism as well the third sort of um the third sort of uh, parallelism we might think about is it what we call instruction level parallelism so um most of our processes these days um are, are basically scalar processes so um they're not the vector processes of old um and but we started to build up the instruction level parallelism once more in these processes. So started with a fuse, if say a fuse multiply add, so a single operation to do um, uh, f is a x plus y, and you could do that as a single operation. So that's instruction level, uh, right down at the instruction level of the, of the processor. You can do this bit bit together, and this has now grown. And so despite the fact we have our scalar processes, we now have single instruction, multiple data, SIMD, um, for, which is combined with data parallelism. Um, uh, people call this vectorization on a, mid, uh, on a modern CPU, but this is distinct from the pipeline vectorization on true vector processes that um, that uh, probably predated the massively parallel machines, like the, the like the, some of the craze, and in fact some of the um, NEC um, SX machines. They were true vector pipe pipeline vector uh, processes. Uh, but these days the processes are actually but a scalar, but then we do this uh, SIMD, which gets called vectorization, but it's not the same thing. So basically, if you have your data laid out in memory and you have two uh, blocks of memory that are taking up with, with values like this, um, so the data layout is the same for both pieces of data, in some sense, this is a vector, then I can combine them together in one operation as long as I'm doing them uh, like uh, memory element by memory element like this, and I can do this in a single operation. So this is single instruction for multiple data. I do the same thing to every single piece of data. Uh, it's also very similar to what happens on a GPU. Uh, it's called coalesce memory access uh, for a GPU, but it's actually single instruction, multiple thread. So rather than multiple data, it's multiple thread, but the uh, outcome is very similar, shall we say. So this is the kind of instruction level parallelism we need to be exploiting on these new uh, processes with the GPUs or the, the uh, these new ARM processors that have these uh, um, scalable vector instruction units on the SVEs. Uh, Simon mentioned these earlier this morning, and I will talk more a little bit more about these, uh, these these later. So that's the kind of thing we have to exploit in terms of uh, both the, the the models and and that's some things we might want to do in hardware. Um, but parallelism is not actually a new idea. In fact, Lewis Fry Richardson um, first attempted a numerical weather uh, prediction calculation. Um, during uh, 1916, sorry, there's a typo in that slide, 1916 to uh, uh, 1918, uh, when he was a volunteer for an ambulance unit on the Western Front. Uh, he had a seven by seven by five grid, that had a 250 uh, kilometer resolution of Europe, and he had two three hour time steps. And it took him two years to do this calculation by hand. Uh, unfortunately, he got the answer completely wrong, he got the answer wrong for two reasons. Firstly, his starting point was completely wrong, so he was never going to be able to uh, get it right from there. But also, he didn't know something about something called the CFL condition, which is to do with fluid dynamics, and in fact, would have needed to do uh, six rather than two time steps for that, one hour each, and that would have taken him then, uh, uh, rather than two years, it would have taken him uh, uh, six years to do that calculation uh, to get the answer right. But in, the, in, in 1922, he wrote a paper called Weather Prediction by Numerical Process, um, where he recognized the problem was parallel. He recognized the problem was data parallel, and you could split the problem up 
um, and for each little surface area of the earth you could have one processor one computer doing the calculation and you might have to do a bit of uh, like passing messages you know passing some data to your, to your neighboring computer and you need to do synchronization and here's a picture of what his parallel supercomputer would look like with 64,000 computers but of course in 1922 a computer was someone who computed a person a person who would do the calculation by hand because there was no automated machinery computers to do it for you and so this is a, a picture here so you've got all these people doing the calculations by hand uh, they might um, do a little bit of mess, like pass bits of paper with numbers on to their neighbors you've got the conductor up here to do the synchronization to make sure everyone's doing the calculation in lockstep to slow some people down or speed some people up if they're not doing it not doing it quite right uh, but this is exactly what a modern supercomputer does. Um, it's just the fact that rather than having a person, I've got a, a, a processor to, to, to do it. So that's um, so he recognised that already in 1922 before we actually had any uh, real computers to to do that calculation automatically. Um, so I'm going to come on to the, the next section of my talk called Building a Model, um, which starts with designing a dynamical core. But are there any questions on, on the first bit of that before we go on? I don't see any questions on the chat. So if you okay. have a question, please write them down. Or... So I think you can go on, Chris. Okay, so building a model, designing a dynamical core. So what has to go into um, a weather and climate model? Well, there are certainly some things that are quite specific to the domain of uh, weather and climate model. The most obvious one being the geometry. Um, it's spherical. Uh, to start with uh, is the first is the first obvious thing, uh, but it's not completely spherical. We also have orography. There are mountains that um, distort the surface of the Earth, so it's not completely spherical. Next thing to note is the atmosphere is inf is thin and vertically highly stratified. Uh, there's such a thing uh, called the Kármán line. It's about 100 kilometers up, and below the Kármán line, it's almost all of the atmosphere by mass. Beyond that, the um, there is layers, excuse me, of the atmosphere, but maybe they're not so much behaving as a gas now because the particles are so far uh, so, so, so farly separated. So the diagram on the left, this diagram here, um, it, it's 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 drawn to scale. Um, it's drawn to scale uh, for an atmosphere is 600 kilometers deep. If I drew it with uh, to scale with an atmosphere that's only 100 kilometers deep, it's just a thin blue line around that sphere. That's how thin the atmosphere really is. And the point is the radius of the Earth is much, much greater than the depth of the atmosphere. Um, so that's the first thing, um, important thing about doing our domain. It's spherical, it's closed, um, it's uh, a thin, very thin layer of atmosphere, a large sphere, it rotates. Um, the Earth rotates east to west. Uh, it's not in thermal equilibrium. The sun shines um, and, and, just, and radiation energy enters the atmosphere uh, and then that gets re-radiated out by various means, but it's not in thermal equilibrium. There's an atmosphere, there's an ocean, there's ice and sea ice and land surface, and there are moist chemical and biological processes. So it's a very complicated system. It's a very complex domain. It's multi-component and multi-scale. The models themselves, the codes, um, are large. They might be hundreds of thousands to millions of lines of code. Their legacy in the, in the sense they take a very long time to develop, 10 plus or more longer, decade or longer to develop, and they might be used for 25 years, quarter of a century or more. But they're not static. They don't, uh, they don't, they don't stop being developed. They undergo continuous development. Um, for example, the Met Office Unified Model perhaps has about 20% code change every year. But because they're used in operations and in production, 
the pro change processes are necessarily conservative, um, but that's probably just scientifically prudent. We don't want to change things in a way we don't understand to uh, when, we, when, we, when we're updating our models. Okay, so another look at what goes into a, a model. So there are some equations there. These are the, what we might be called the governing equations or the primitive equations. Um, they are the fluid dynamics, um, the equations of motion for density, humidity, pressure, uh, temperature and wind, mass conservation and thermodynamics. Uh, and that, those are expressed by those equations there. And that, that gets called the dynamics. So we have to solve solve a fluid dynamics problem for, for those things. But that's not the only thing we have to do. We have to do advection and convection. So advection is things being uh, being moved around by the wind, including the wind itself. Um, convection is the is, is is what gets moved due to due to heat movement. Um, and some of these things, and we also have to do the what are called physical prioritizations for processes that are resolved by the dynamics itself. So if our global model is running at 10 kilometers or one kilometers, there are many processes that that, that, that uh, control what goes on in the atmosphere that are not at that scale. So we have to represent those by the physical prioritizations, such as radiation, so uh, solar, and then reflect and re-radiate. Uh, cloud physics, so cloud formation, how clouds change and how they evolve. Precipitation, um, so when eventually cloud physics goes on, eventually some of those moisture particles get sufficiently big that they fall out of the sky. It's rain, snow, hail, other things. Um, there's land surface processes, there's atmospheric chemistry going on. Um, and we have to couple the, the atmosphere to the ocean and couple the atmosphere to the sea ice system. So it's a very complicated system that we have to solve. The dynamics equations themselves are differential equations of a continuous system. We have to approximate those to algebraic equations of a discrete system so that we can then solve them numerically. So in order to do that, the first thing we have to do is choose a grid. Ah. Uh, I appear to be missing a picture there, but never mind. Uh, I'll see if I can fix that. Um, so you have different choices of grid. So because we're on a, we are on a sphere, we have a fixed geometry, and that presents some problems with trying to draw a grid onto that uh, onto that uh, surface. So we could start with a latitude longitude grid. Uh, which is a structured grid, so you know your neighbours by construction. For example, this is used by the Unified Model at the Met Office. Um, the next one here is a octahedral Gaussian grid. Um, it's also done as a structured grid, um, but as you go closer to the poles, you have less points, um, and so you don't have quite as many points as you do on the longitude latitude grid, which presents its own problems, but then you have to um, so describe how you start to lose points as you go close to the poles. This is done in, all, in an ordered way. So this grid, for example, is used by the uh, by a model called the IFS by the European Centre. I did have a picture of a cube sphere here, but it seems to be missing for some reason. Um, hopefully, it will appear later in a different slide. Um, so we have the cube sphere. Uh, which is basically you take a cube, imagine taking a cube and blowing really hard into the corners until it turns into a sphere, you inflate it. And so you have um, basically a square, square mesh, but those mesh get slightly distorted in order to make it uh, fit like uh, go over a sphere. And you can do that in a structured way, uh, which is, for example, FV3, uh, which is uh, the US agency NOAA, um, they that use the Q sphere as a structured grid, and or for example, the Gung Ho Elfric model, which has been developed at the Met Office, that's done as an unstructured mesh. And I'll talk a little bit more about structured and unstructured meshes in a minute. Uh, we've also already heard this morning about uh, ICON, which is uh, used by the Joe Weather Centre. Um, it uses an icosahedral mesh, uh, as a picture of it. Uh, um, okay. That's not the icon mesh, actually. Um, you can have an icosahedral mesh, which is unstructured done with icon. The mesh pictured here is actually from MPAS, which is another group, uh, another group 
mother group in the US. Um, it's a, a Voronoi stretch meshes, and so you can have uh, higher resolution. They have regions of interest, in this case, the US, because the US based group, uh, but they have a global model with variable resolution because you can just, for example, take the mesh and, and put it until you get a higher resolution in one side and a lower resolution the other way on the other side. Um, and those are some examples of. Uh, some meshes that you might use. Now, these meshes have different properties uh, and different, uh, different ways of discretization that you would then do on them, and then you've got to um, have different benefits and different problems with using them. So the choice of grid uh, was based on the numerical analysis and symmetry properties that it then produces. And it has consequences for both the accuracy and the stability of the numerical method. Now we want our numerical methods to be both accuracy, accurate and stable. And um, so depending on how you do them, you can choose to do a structured grid or an unstructured grid. Now, a structured grid, um, neighboring grid points or cells are known. Um, you have direct memory access. So here's, for example, is a, a 2D stencil access to uh, with, with a structured grid. So if you're accessing uh, element I of the grid and you want to make a stencil, then your neighbors are plus or minus one. So this is what I mean by a structured grid. You know where your neighbors are by construction. You can just say, okay, here you are. Give me my, like, just address the memory directly. This is good for data, data locality. Uh, which is important for uh, caching. So, for example, if I start to get, if I'm looping through this uh, over all the i, when I go and get um, the data element i, my cache will be full of all, all, of all the memory addresses greater than i, and so those will already be memory and I want to use them. And as I go through, I will have already picked up these guys the previous time. So it's good for caching as, as a, a structured grid. However, the geometry of a sphere that can be problematic can generate problematic communication patterns, uh, which we shall see in a minute. The other choice you could make is to use an unstructured grid, in which case the neighboring grid points or cells are not known. You have to use a lookup table, uh, which is indirect memory access. So here, for example, is the same stencil for an unstructured grid. So I need you, I need a map to find out where this the cell is in memory. And then to access its neighbors, I have to answer the stencil map in order to, to, to get the same stencil map for this and there are two neighbors, but I don't know where they are, so I can't address them directly. I have to go via the lookup table. That's bad for data locality. It's bad for caching, but it helps avoid the can help avoid the communication problems, uh, pattern problematic communication patterns that we will I will talk about in a bit. So there is kind of two choices there of uh, which foot do you want to shoot yourself in, uh, because data movement um, is 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 the thing that's going to ultimately limit our calculation, and this one's good for local data but potentially bad for communication this one's bad for local data but potentially good for communication so you uh, choose your poison chris we have a question on the icosahedral grid great it's, okay uh, isn't the icosahedral grid more computationally expensive uh not necessarily uh, it can be um, so it depends. So these, these, these the, the, um, at both MPAS and ICON have what are called a finite volume uh, method, and so they are computing. Um, yeah, uh, Julian's just posted an answer that I would agree with, um, and so I'll come, I will touch upon this in the next slides as well. So, for example, if I use a finite volume method, I'm computing values across the whole cell, and that's potentially more expensive. But if it's more accurate than doing a grid point uh, finite difference calculation, I can probably do that on a coarser resolution. So it's not obvious necessarily that a particular grid is more produce a more or less expensive model. There are just different choices, and they have different um, aspects of uh, stability and accuracy. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. 
I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we have our grid, and now we have to discretize our, our um, equations. So we have to represent our uh, differential equations as uh, algebraic equations. And we can do this, there's a number of methods for doing this that will have different properties, um, including computational cost and accuracy. So in the top left, we have, uh, my, I've got the same curve each time, but, but I've got to represent it um, in a discrete way. It's a 1D problem, it's like a 2D problem, so um, it's just a curve, uh, but I can represent it as finite differences. So these are values at uh, grid points. So I just take the difference between these two things to generate the gradient. So if I want a more accurate representation of this curve, I need more grid points, um, but that costs more calculation. Um, on, on the right over here, I could try a finite volume method. So these are values then that are averaged across the cell. Um, so here, here they are, these are uh, lowest order for finite volume, these are constant, but I could also choose a higher order method, which would be linear or, or quadratic for finite, finite volume. Um, I could choose a finite vol element method where instead of representing values across each cell, I could I represent them by functions uh, across each cell. Um, in this case, these are linear functions because I'm doing a low order finite element method and I need them for each cell, which is what I'll try to show here. And or I could go for I'll go the whole way and use a spectral method um, where I represent my uh, discretization as a uh, periodic functions occur over the whole domain and each the values at each point are then some uh, some sum of these periodic functions and these are almost always trigonometric or in fact hyperbolic functions across the whole domain um, all of these can be done at higher order I've shown lowest order in each case so um, perhaps to answer a little bit more the 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 previous question about is the grid more expensive well the, I can do these different methods on all these grids um, and they have different advantages and disadvantages in terms of uh, computation okay so that was discretizing the sp space but I also need to do discrete in time so I need to do time stepping um, I also need to discretize time. And again, I have choices of the, 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 the grid, um, or in this case, what the time stepping scheme is. Now, there's an important piece of mathematics called the current Frederick Louis condition or CFL condition for stability. Um, and so, for example, for a 1D evection where you use the wave velocity, then the ratio of the um, time size of the time step to the space discretization must be less than a certain number and the C number depends on you and the discretization scheme but typically it's of order one and so if I make my time step too big I will violate that condition and I won't have a numerically stable answer and that's what happened to Lewis Farrell Richardson in his first calculation but then it gets a little bit more complicated than that of course because I'm not just solving 1D advection I'm solving some very complicated equations um, there are also many different uh, atmospheric waves at different scales. So I can have acoustic waves, uh, which are just sound waves, gravity, gravito inertial waves or gravity waves, uh, Rosby waves. And they also have different wavelengths and they, so they can have different treatments in your model. And you can uh, treat them in different ways as well. Like we can do an explicit treatment where the next time step depends only on the previous one. Or I can do an implicit method where this, the, the value for the field at this time step depends on some function of the previous time step and the value on this time step as well. I also have to think about advection and I can do uh, Eulerian, which is a, a simple discretization versus semi-Lagrangian, which is a much more complex discretization. And basically these come down to if I do things that are labeled I, so that's the explicit and Eulerian, those are cheap to compute but they give me a very small time step because of CFL. So I have to do them a lot. Or I can take a bigger time step if I do things labeled two, so that's implicit, semi-implicit, and semi-Lagrangian. Those give me a much bigger time step, but they're costly to compute. So again, it's which foot do you want to shoot yourself in? Do you want to do lots of cheap time steps or do you want to take a few costly ones? Um, so those are your kind of uh, choices when you, when you construct your numerical scheme. 
So dynamic summary. Um, yeah, this is not a course on the dynamics nor on numerical analysis, but I'm just trying to make the points here that choices of discretization, the space, uh, space for the grid and for the time discretization, and the method we use to solve the, 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 to represent these equations, the order, the time stepping scheme constructed, and the solution method create different patterns of computation, uh, computational and data dependency and communication. So there's not an obvious what's best answer. It depends what you're trying to do. Um, and these different choices result in, 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 in the different uh, computational and communication patterns that you're then going to have to try and represent in, 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 the, in the supercomputer. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, dynamics and or in fact numerical analysis um, and numerical methods for wave equations, I would recommend reading uh, Dale Duran's book, Numerical Methods for Wave Equations in Geophysical Fluid Dynamics. Um, and I've just touched upon some of the issues, issues here. Uh, so I am just going to pause for a second again before I go on to the next bit. Oh, sorry. I'm not because I've got one more slide on this section, I think. Um, so well, that's just the dynamics. Um, we um, think about uh, the physical parameterization. So these are all processes that are not resolved at the grid scale. So either they're not present in, in the dynamics or the grid scale is too coarse to resolve these processes. So they might be uh, processes that only happen at the surface. So, for example, vegetation. I've got a picture of a tree there. Uh, I've got short wave radiation from the sun. This is how energy enters the model. Uh, I've got long wave radiation, radiation from clouds and from the surface. It might be reabsorbed by the cloud or reabsorbed by the surface and re-emitted again, but that's typically how energy will leave the, the, the system. Um, there's convection. Uh, so this guy, like, uh, uh, air moving around. Um, this may produce things like thunderstorms and precipitation. So when some of these uh, clouds then form, some of the droplets become sufficiently large that they fall out the sky, um, changing the moisture content of, of the air as they do so. So all these processes have to also to be represented by individual schemes in a model. So in terms of uh, time step components, then um, we basically have things that are like the dynamics, which so the advection and then something called the solver, which is going to solve the equations I've just described uh, according to their representation. Um, and those are the two big time steps components for the dynamics. And then we have to do the, what's called the physics, the physical prioritizations. And typically these come into two sorts of flavors. They're what's called fast physics, which is cheap to compute, but changes quickly. So you need to compute it a lot. And what we call slow physics, which is costly to compute, but doesn't change very often compared to the size of the time step. Um, and so there are different methods and algorithms for solving these problems. And so I'm going to reference a paper here, Crossing the Chasm, How to Develop Weather and Climate Models for Next Generation Supercomputers by Lawrence et al. It's in uh, GMED. Um, there's the DOI there. Um, and that's where I've taken these um, these uh, pictures from of time steps for different models. Um, so. Chris, we do have a question on convection. How are we representing convection and what are the different methods? Okay, that's a, that's a good question and that's probably an entire topic uh, for uh, um, a model in itself. Um, I don't have any material on that myself. Um, I claim I'm a computational scientist rather than a meteorologist, um, so I don't have uh, a handy answer to that question. But there are different different um, schemes for representing convection. So you have some equations that you need to solve in the same way that we do for the dynamics, and you have to then have those discretized on the grid, and then you come up with those different solution methods. So that's not a very Accurate answer, I guess. But I think that, um, yeah, maybe if I can complete, often in our model, we're not, um, I mean, the resolution is not uh, good enough to really disguise a convection, so it's usually parametrized. And if we would get to the one to two kilometer scale in our resolution, then we would uh, have to change complete, well, completely, but, but then we would have to change our uh, subgrid scale representation because then we would be. Um, uh, really uh, representing the convection itself. So that's a big, big step that we are 
trying to achieve, but we're not there yet in our climate model, is to be able to uh, to really resolve the convection. So now yeah. we're not resolving that, and it's parameterized. I guess. Yeah. I think yeah, and that's, that's yeah, definitely. That's uh, from the uh, NWP numerical weather. Uh, prediction perspective. So the Met Office, we run a global model that has a 10 kilometer resolution that does not resolve convection at all. So we have a parameterized convection scheme for, for the global model, but we run a high resolution model over, for example, the United Kingdom at one kilometers. And there we turn off the parameterized scheme and let it just happen in dynamics. And so we have to have a different scheme. So uh, representing convection itself is actually um, it is a whole topic for a cycle. <laughs> Okay, we've got a follow-up question. Um, so the short answer is uh, this is not. I don't. I don't have a good answer for you. I will try and come back with some post some better answers about convection because it's not. It's not particularly my area of expertise, and I don't want to end up misleading someone. Um, so Joyce, thank you for your question, um, but I, I I don't have a good answer for you right now. I'll try and come back to you with a better answer. Uh, if I find some to find to, to find some resources from someone who actually works in that area, if that, if that may, if that helps. Okay. So yes, I am going to come on. So there's a question: Can you elaborate a bit on why you made the choices you made for Alfred among all the representative possibilities you just represented? So yes, I am going to come on to that in 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 a, in a in another part of the, the talk in a second. Um, okay, so I'm just going to finish off this section of the talk here. So, um, so these are pictures of um, uh, representations of time steps for different models. So they're doing they're solving the dynamics in a different way, with a different method, or a different mesh. They've got different physical prioritizations, but they all have things in common. They all have um, dynamics, so they have to do advection and do a solver. Uh, and they have their physical prioritizations, which they might do as uh, full uh, full values or increments, depending on which around they're doing it, and they have to be all combined together. Um, and they have different loop structures through there. Um, so this one here is the IFS from ECMWF. So it does a, a spectral transform and then does various things and does all the physical parameterizations and calls the solver and then comes back out of spectral space back into uh, um, grid point space. This is a, a model from GFDL called Haram. Um, and it has a different time step structure. This is the Bet Office's unified model. It does some updates, fast, uh, slow physics, then call this, uh, then it do the, uh, there's the advection, um, then it does some more uh, physical prioritization updates, and these are the, all the fast physics one because they're in the new loop. Then we call the solver, solve the equations, and go back and do it all again. This is the Metaphysical Unified Model. So you can see that there are quite complicated patterns in, in these time steps. So there are some similarities between all the models. Um, they all have to do the physical prioritizations. They all have to do the um, uh, dynamics. So they have to have a solver and they have to have advection. But they do them in different, because they're solving different problems in different ways, the structure of the time step is quite different. And so their scaling behavior will also then be quite different on a parallel supercomputer. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to talk about parallel scaling in in general. Um, uh, I'm just going to take a just a quick pause there to see if I've got. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer in detail more things about con convection, but that's just one prioritization out of many, um, and there are many. Okay, so parallel scaling. So, okay, so I'll introduce Amdel's law. Um, so P is a, is a portion of the program which is parallelizable. Uh, then S is the maximum speed up achievable compared to the serial code. So if I have a like a, a program which is uh, only three quarters of which is parallel, and the rest is is just serial only for, for various reasons, then 
there is a limit to the speed up I can achieve by using more and more processes on the parallel section. Um, sorry, if you can just, excuse me a second, I'm just going to shut my door. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so Andar's law. So um, if I have if it's complete serial, but the parallel section of the code is is at three quarters, then I've got this 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 graphic here. Uh, if I have two uh, threads or two parallel elements, um, and I split the work between those two, then the amount of time it takes goes down by half, but not for the whole code, only for the parallelizable bit. If I have four processes or four parallel elements or four threads, I can uh, reduce this down to a quarter of the original time taken for the parallel bit. But because some of the code is still serial, then the actual speed up is only uh, a factor of two and, a, two and a bit. So in the limit in which the uh, parallel code, sorry, the limit in which the number of parallel elements or parallel processes goes to infinity, I can shrink this down to nothing, but the serial part will remain and so the maximum speed up I can enchain, uh, achieve uh, is a factor of four. So that's if I have a serial portion and a parallel portion but we can of course uh, think about this a little bit more. Even if all parts of the program are parallelized they will have different scaling behavior so this is scaling behavior how far how well the uh, program how the program behaves with different numbers of processes how it scales um, they will have different scaling behavior due to the amount of communication between parallel elements that they have to do. So it's not so much that we have a serial and parallel code, we have a uh, parallel code that is parallel in different ways. So if I go back to this graphic I had earlier, um, this shows a kind of stencil based calculation that required data from their neighbor. So if each grid point or each cell depends on its neighbors, um, for those in the interior here of a single of a, of a partition domain, they don't need to do any communication. I can just loop through all the elements and calculate them. But the guys that sit on the edge, they will need to be able to get data from their neighbor. And so we have this um, data pattern called halo exchange. So where we have um, the the inner core, which doesn't depend, uh, which is all contained in the partition, but these guys on the edge will depend on data from their neighbor. So I have another copy of that neighbor uh, on both uh, halos, and I have to swap those. Um, the size of the stencil, and the size of the stencil depends on the order of the method and things like that, and whether you're doing so many Grangian, um, that tells you the size of the halo or the halo depth, which is then how much data you're going to have to communicate. Um, so these semi Lagrangian methods I alluded to earlier have larger halos, and so they have to communicate more data, for example. So this type of communication is point-to-point, uh, -point, so it's processor to processor, point-to-point, -point, and it's bandwidth limited. Okay, another type of parallel communication we might have to do is global communication. So global communication, all parallel elements uh, take part. Um, they might be things like reductions, uh, so a global sum that you need an iterative solvers, and these are latency bound. Uh, we might have all-to-all -all communications, like for example, we need inspectral transforms. Well, these are both latency and bandwidth bound. Uh, and something else that might use parallel uh, global communications um, is I.O. So to get data into and out of the model, uh, we might have uh, serial data to parallel memory and vice versa. Uh, and that is both latency, sorry, that is latency bandwidth and raw data rate bound. Um, there's, in fact, a quote from a, an American computer scientist, uh, Ken Kennedy, a supercomputer is a, a computer that turns a compute bound problem into an IO bound problem. So if we get very good at solving all these equations in parallel and making our, our parallel code run very fast on these massive supercomputers, we then have lots of data that we have to get into and out of the machine. And so certainly for climate models, it, and uh, IO becomes the, the, the ultimate problem that we have to solve. And we will hear about this, I guess, later in the summer school. Okay, so then we can think about how does our program um, 
uh, what's its performance, what speed does it run at on different numbers of processors, this is, and how does that change as we change the number of processors, how does it scale, uh, and then we have two sorts of scaling we can think about. There's uh, weak scaling, where we might keep the local problem size fixed, so the data size per parallel element is fixed, the work rate is constant, uh, as I increase the number of processes, the amount of local communication increases across the whole problem, but not per parallel element, and the global communication increases. So to do that, I'll be changing, we would have to change the size of the global problem, um, and our global problem is fixed, but we could change the resolution, so we could do weak scaling, but we'd also have to change the time step to do that. So that gets a little confusing if we start changing the time step as well. So typically, we, uh, for weather and climate, we're more interested in what they call strong scaling, where we keep the global problem size fixed, i.e. the number of data points, the resolution, and um, so the size of the globe is fixed, but the resolution is not, but keep the resolution fixed, so the amount of work per power element will decrease um, as we use more processors because each processor will then have less work to do. So we can do the computation faster, but the local communication will also decrease, but it's much, much slower because of surface to volume uh, effects. Um, so if I start with uh, a, a, quite a coarse prioritization, the boundary is, 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 is size. If I make that problem smaller, the boundary is, is is still smaller, but not as not as much as the interior. So um, the local communication will also decrease, but much slower than the amount of work. So the net amount of local communication grows compared to computation with strong scaling, and the global communication will increase because I have more processes taking part. And so we get to what we call the strong scaling regime, where communication now dominates uh, what's happening and not computation. At which point there's not really much point in using more processes, you're just going to make it take longer because you're just doing communication and, and not really any computation. So those are our two uh, scaling regimes and it's really the strong scaling that we're probably more interested in seeing. But we also have to think about levels of parallelism because this simple model of parallelism doesn't map terribly well onto modern complex processes. Typically, they are exhibiting multiple levels of parallelism and requiring multiple programming models to exploit them. Um, and you might, and here's a, a die photo of something called Knight's, Intel's Knight's Landing or Xeon Phi, which um, is a sort of de defunct processor line. Uh, ran, it was, was going to be um, the processor that saved HPC for Intel, but ultimately it didn't work out as well as they'd hoped, and it's now, it's now a, a defunct processor line. Uh, it has lots of little processing uh, cores on it. It's a very parallel device. Um, uh, okay, so how do we program these things? Well, typically we're going to use something, uh, we can use the MPI um, message passing interface library, which is very well established for data parallelism between nodes. Um, uh, and that work has been very successful. But if you want to program these complex devices that are made of multiple multiple cores, many multiple cores, MPI is probably not the best thing to do for uh, all the parallelism on node. And so we have this MPI plus X model where MPI is used for the internode distributed memory communication. And then there are some other programming model X, which we use for the intranode parallelism. And usually for weather and climate models, that's probably going to be some combination the open MP or possibly open ACC, um, depending on what you're doing. So uh, we'll have a, a siren showed some of these this morning, but again, it might be worth having a quick look at what we might see in some of these nodes. So this is the Met Office Cray XC40. It's currently number 32 on the top 500 list. Uh, when we got the machine, it was at number 11. Um, these are dual socket 18 core Intel Xeon processors. Uh, here's a picture of uh, a board, which is, uh, this is four nodes on a single board. So there is one communication processor for four nodes. Uh, each node has two individual processors. You can see here, they've had the heat exchangers removed, so you can see them. Um, here's some memory, 
here's some memory um, and each of these is a, an individual uh, Xeon processor 18 cores so a dual socket one a dual socket node has two of these processors and they both these processors can see all the memory uh, for that node but the paths between the memory and the processor are different. So from here to here is not the same as here to here. So we have what's called non-uniform memory access. Um, so close memory is faster than going to the memory that, that sits next to this processor, even though you can see it all and you can dress it all. So you can use shared memory um, and we do, but typically you want to use it uh, just for the Yuma region and not across the NUMA. So you might want a way of partitioning up so you use at most 18 uh, so even though this one can see all this memory, you only want to use 18 cores to look at this one and 18 cores to look at this one at most um, and treat that as being distributed. They also have 256-bit uh, AVX SIMD for instruction level parallelism on them. And in the meta of Great C40 machine, we have 6,500 nodes. So you can program with MPI only. Uh, the Unified model has had some success with using this MPI plus OpenMP, this hybrid model, MPI plus X, in this case OpenMP. That's quite common across scientific applications now, and the, uh, the UM uses that quite successfully. It uses 30 megawatts uh, electricity to power the whole machine. Okay, let's get to the next slide. So uh, if we look at Summit, this is the machine at Oak Ridge National Lab, or NEL in the USA. It's uh, number two on the top 500 list. It's a, the dual IBM 9 Power 9 processors, so those are 22 core CPUs. So, so that's this bit down here underneath this heat exchanger. And then there are six NVIDIA Volta GPUs one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and two power nine nodes per node. So there's host and device memory. So each GPU has its own device memory that only it can see, but there's also host memory that's over here. Uh, and so the these wires here, these big black thick wires here are something called NVLink. So these are fast, uh, high bandwidth, uh, connections between the GPUs themselves and the CPU and then to main memory as well. Um, each uh, Volta GPU has 84 streaming multiprocessors and each SM, so streaming multiprocessor, has 64 32-bit cores and 32 64-bit cores and then there's a hierarchy of these things grouped together into blocks, warps and threads and you program using oversubscribed concurrency, so many more threads running than those actual cores. And so you really want to run with tens of thousands of these single instruction multiple threads per GPU. And there's six GPUs per node, and there are about 4,000 nodes. So this is the top uh, number two on the top 500 list. And as a whole, it consumes 500 megawatts of, sorry, 15 megawatts of power. Okay, so this is then uh, uh, the Fugaku. It's uh, the Japanese machine uh, based at Riken. It's number one on the top 500 list. Um, it's the Fujitsu 64-bit ARM processor. So these are in fact CPUs. Um, so if you remember uh, my, my first slide, I had a picture of someone getting a, an award for saying you couldn't do you couldn't do um, um, an exaflop with CPUs. Well, the point is you can, but you use a heck of a lot of power. So this is nearly 30 megawatts, and that's before you do any cooling. So the whole system has got to be, uh, I don't know, a huge, a huge amount of power. But 28 megawatts is a lot of electricity just to power the machine before you do any cooling. And so the point was, can you do it for less than 20 megawatts with a CPU? And they've worked really, really hard, and they've got it down to 28, but that's still more than 28 megawatts. So 20 megawatts was seen as the limit of affordability, but actually um, it's just too hard to get there. People have gone for, for, for more power. Um, 
Okay. Um, yes, that's a good question. I had a question, so let me get to the question. Do I uh, have uh, the number of flops for each machine? Okay, so I'll just go back then. So the Met, I haven't written this down, the Met Office um, XC40, which consumes three megawatts, will do about 16 petaflops. Something like that would be its peak speed. So 16 petaflops for three megawatts. Uh, Summit, um, I think, I think it's about 200, uh, 200 petaflops for 15 megawatts. Um, and Ricken, the machine at Ricken, the PQ is supposed to be able to do an exaflop for the 28 megawatts. So um, I think you can check the top 500 for those numbers because that's what the top 500 reports. It's like how many flops can you do for that power? So, the so how much is for the last for for Fugaku? Uh, they, how much um, flops? It's over an exaflop. So an exaflop. So the ratio, I mean, even if the whole machine uses more power, the ratio of flops per megawatt increases a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so they, this is quite a complex processor in itself, even though it's not an accelerator, the architecture of the processor, it's very complicated. So there are 48 uh, compute cores on it, arranged in four uh, blocks of 12 mini NUMA regions. Um, so that's kind of like, here's a mini NUMA region here with its own memory. So all the processors can see all the memory, but um, the uh, some of them, the memory is like if you want to access the memory over here for this processor that will be slower than accessing your local one so there, there's NUMA regions um, each processor has two um, of these SIMD units so two 512 bit scalable vector extension SIMD units it's instruction level parallelism remember I talked about that earlier and there's something like 150,000 plus nodes so that's 7 million plus cores um, so itself is quite a complex processor, even though it's not an accelerator, um, it doesn't have that level of complexity, but it does have um, quite, uh, quite a complex architecture. Those of you who are good at counting will notice there are more than 48 cores on this processor. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So there's an extra processor uh, per mini NUMA region, um, and uh, that they're not. Com that's not part of the compute system. I'm not sure what it does, but it's probably one of them is going to be used for doing helping out with the communication with using the. Um, with, we are one of them to be helping out with communication or running the operating system or something. Um, I think I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, I think that's true. Um, but yes, you can see there are in fact more than 48 cores, but 48 of them are compute cores. Okay, there's a question from Pablo. Did you use Fugaku? Is it different than the Met Office cr uh, Cray, uh, the compilation and the execution? So no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't used it. Um, yes, it will be different to the to the Met Office Cray. Um, in principle, you could try and use the same programming model we have on the Met Office Cray, which is OpenMP and MPI. And in fact, that's probably what you should use to program it. But you have to take out of these um, scalable vector extension SIMD units. So li uh, lining your code in memory to take advantage of these and possibly using OpenMP 4.5 extensions to program these is what you need to do. So we haven't done a lot of that work yet, so I don't know how successful we'd be at, at exploiting that straight out the tin. Um, it's a similar architecture to Isambard, the machine at the Met Office, which is the one, Julie, um, one Simon talked about, but that doesn't have the the, the 512 bit scalable vector extension units in. So um, I think you would probably have to do some work in the code to exploit these things, um, to exploit this, to use a program to get hold of these bits. So it would have to be different to the Met Office Cray. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> 
Okay, so I'm just going to pause there to see if there is uh, any other or any other questions. So we are uh, one hour in the presentation, so I think you're doing quite fine. So there's uh, officially 20, uh, 30 minutes left. Okay, so I hope everyone's surviving. Uh, this is quite a long presentation, but there we go. Okay, so then next slide. Um, okay, so this is then looking at um, some... Um, Scaling. I've sorry, I've lost my presentation. No. Okay, so this, uh, so if we look at, for example, the scaling of the Met Office Unified model, so this compares relative scaling of the global model for a very high resolution, so uh, what's called an N2048, so that's six kilometer global model of resolution, uh, and uh, a limited and, and the limited area model, so just um, a, a small region of the globe, uh, uh, typically over the UK. So these are normalized to kind of have the same, uh, normalized to be one about here for both of them for the second datum. So that's red for the global model and blue for the uh, local area model. Um, and both have a similar um, amount of uh, data points per MPI task. So about two and a half thousand per uh, MPI task uh, down down here. So as I increase the number of processors, so this is if whatever however many this is, um, uh, then you know increase it by almost a factor of ten to get up to eighty eight thousand cores. Um, you can see that the blue um, is scaling much better than the red, and the blue is the local area model. So as it, this is this is perfect scaling. So if I uh, double or quadruple the number of processors, the thing goes four times as fast. So that would be perfect scaling. So that's this dashed line. Um, the sticks show the me actual measurements, and you can see that as we get less, we go towards the strong scaling limit. So the number of data points per parallel element decreases. Um, you can see that the 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 global model, the red, doesn't scale as well as the blue, which is the local area model. Okay. Um, so this is uh, a, a data from uh, Selwood and Malcolm. So the lamb is scaling much better than the global model. And why is that? Okay, so um, and we can take a look at this further and look at the parallel efficiency of the components of the model. So this is one of the latest versions of the UM, 11.6. So the parallel efficiency is the time taken for N processors divided by the time it took on whatever my starting point here, in this case, 128 nodes, um, and uh, divided by the number of that, the same ratio for the number of nodes. So at the starting point, it's one by default, and then we'll see how the different components scale. So one, in this case is perfect scaling because it's the parallel efficiency. Um, so I quadruple the number of nodes and then double and then double again. So this is run on the Met, Cray, Met Office XC40. It's for the global 2048, six kilometer resolution. Uh, it's the mixed program model with MPI plus OpenMP. So it's three or six threads and then the rest MPI. Uh, the time step itself, which is in brown, seems to scale reasonably well, about 80% parallel efficiency, even when I've uh, uh, quadrupled and doubled and doubled, so I quadrupled twice. So sorry, six sorry, six Chris, six Chris, six Chris, six again, again, with T and R, R, T, T, and T, O, T, O, and N, N, O, and O, so that we have T is the time taken, and N is the number of nodes. Oh, okay, Um. So the, the time step itself seems to scale reasonably well. Physics scales really well, 
so that's the fast physics and the slow physics in yellow. Um, so they seem to scale pretty well and stay close to one. The solver seems to super linear scale at some points and get right up to, to here. I think that's, that's just a memory effect. So as I make, as I do strong scaling and I go four times the number of nodes, then my working set reduces by a factor of four as well. So I'm suddenly going to fit into cache and this is memory bound. So that's that effect there. And then when I go a bit further, we start to see the communication cost kick in. So the scaling comes back down again. Uh, it's advection that is scaling really badly. So that's that's the, uh, the the red in the middle here. Advection scales badly and it gets down to about ooh, 60, 50, 60 percent when I've uh, uh, the number of processes increased by a factor of 16 and it's advection that's scaling poorly. Um, and why is that? So uh, this is the so-called finger of blame. So in the unified model, we have this longitude latitude grid. Um, it has lots of really good symmetry properties for the mathematics, which means the mathematics works really well. It's an orthogonal coordinate system that all those mathematics works out quite nicely. So that's seen as advantageous. But uh, as we increase the resolution near the poles, the grid points get really, really close together. Um, and we're doing semi Lagrangian advection for stability. That's large halos. That's lots of communication near the poles. So as we go to higher resolutions, in this case, six kilometer resolution, the number of communication near the poles goes up dramatically. And that is what is spoiling the scaling for the UM. So we can also look at, can, can we help out with just doing OpenMP rather than MPI um, if we increase the amount of OpenMP? So um, MPI on the communication can be quite efficient. However, OpenMP uh, reduces the amount of, uh, um, Increasing the amount of OpenMP reduces the amount of MPI communication required um, and helps with the balance of computation and communication. So this is taken from Glover et al. Uh, Glover et al. Uh, for Cray User Group 2016. Um, and it looks at the effect of using the same resource uh, but um, changing it from MPI to OpenMP. So here's the timings for the different components. So there's the whole whole time step. Uh, the solver, the advection, and, and fast and slow physics. And then if I double the number of processes, the, the timings get better, but they don't scale perfectly. If I double the number of processes, but uh, instead use more threads instead of more MPI ranks and keep the number of MPI threads fixed, then some components seem to do quite well. Uh, for example, the solver and the advection. Uh, other things don't. This is this complex scaling behavior of the different components again. Uh, the solver and advection both have lots of communication. So the OMP benefit, uh, say lots of OpenMP benefit. If I use more OpenMP threads, I've got less MPI rank, so I have communication to do. Physics is not so much, uh, but lots of th loops to thread. And as of 2016, uh, they, perhaps the coverage of OpenMP and the code wasn't so great, uh, and also potentially uh, there's a poor load balance, um, which if we go to the next slide, I illustrate here, weather is not uniform. Okay, so uh, if I've got each, uh, I've got loads of pixels on here and each one of these, I've got to do a calculation, but only when it's raining. So if I'm doing precipitation calculation, it's not raining here. I don't have to do any calculation. So these processes, the ones that have got this area, aren't doing anything. So load balancing, um, whereas the processes that have this region here have got lots of calculation to do. So that load balancing um, for physical prioritizations, uh, it, it can be quite challenging. So uh, in this paper, they looked at software radio, uh, the sorry, shortwave radiation, like sunlight, um, and looked at because uh, so here's a node, and here are the various grid points, and these ones are lit, they're in sunlight, and these ones are unlit in darkness, um, and so you can see you've got here, if each one of these is an MPI task or MPI rank, then they've each got different amounts of work to do. But you have to figure out beforehand which are the lit points, which ones are in sunlight, um, and we have to do that anyway. So having done that, they looked at the redistributing for load balance, so that um, cost, but then all threads have a similar amount of work. 
um, and they were able to show that they, for a certain in a certain regime, they could get uh, a, a quite a good benefit, about 20% speed up by doing this risk distribution, doing the simplest thing you could think of, uh, and more complex uh, arrangements could be could be derived. Um, and this was just a proof of principle that you can use OpenMP and data redistribution to get a much better load balance um, with doing API compared to OpenMP. Okay, so another pattern that we might look at is something called an I.O. server. So models produce lots of data. Higher resolution means more data. Uh, the I.O. server avoids the model computation waiting whilst the output is done. Um, and it does this by having a dedicated MPI resource to do the output only. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't take part in the calculation. It just waits for the, comp the calculation to finish the time step. Um, most PEs do the computation and then do asynchronous offload of the data and the IO server resources write the data to the files whilst the computation carries on. So this is task parallelism. And then how many IO servers to compute uh, how many I/O servers do you want to compute parallel elements depends on machine characteristic, problem size, diagnostic selected, so what are you writing out, and the compute speed compared to the O speed. And so this takes a lot of tuning for every time you change something. Uh, this is a plot from uh, Julian Kunkel uh, using the DKRZ supercomputer showing different O numbers uh, throughput for different numbers of clients and servers. Uh, different processes per node and various tunable I/O parameters, and then red in red and right in blue, um, and you can see different performance characteristics. And it turns out that for this particular machine, the best performance you could get was about six gigabytes per second uh, output per node if you had a small configuration, and that dropped to 1.5 gigabytes per node if you had a large configuration. Um, and so all these are different tunable parameters. So that's quite a complex space of, of looking at the I.O. performance. Um, but there'll be a whole session on I.O. performance later in this summer school. Um, OK, so that, this is me coming to my last section, I think. Um, so uh, do we have any questions before I go on? OK, no. OK, so the long lag grid will ultimately prevent the UM scaling. And so to, in order to get around that, we have to change the grid. Changing the grid changes everything, because in the unified model, the grid is deeply implicitly embedded in the code, and you can't just change it without changing everything. So um, the Met Office decided in 2010 that it would have to, again, um, and write a new model that didn't use the long lag grid. So there was a project called Gung Ho, which was to decide on how to do dynamics, what mesh to use, and the dynamics. So, uh, and that comes in the paper here, uh, Melvin et al. Um, and that, there's a DOI for that. Um, and so then I've been involved in, heavily involved in writing the new model called Elfric after Lewis Fry Richardson, which uses this gung ho dynamical core. And how do we do that in software? How do we write the code? Uh, and some of this is described in a paper by Adams et al. Uh, and there's the DOI for that publication. OK, so the if the long lag grid is going to stop us scaling, what other mesh could we use so they're going to with gung ho uses this uh, cube sphere so here's a picture of the cube sphere here um, so you have the cube sphere and then you extrude that mesh and you end up with cubes or distorted cubes um, for the cube sphere there are no singular poles like the long mesh uh, we do it as an unstructured mesh um, it could also work with other meshes, but we're using this unstructured mesh for the, so we're using an unstructured mesh so we can change the mesh because the code doesn't know anything about the mesh. Um, everything is done by the properties of the mesh by lookup tables because it's unstructured. Um, in order to get the right symmetry properties and the mathematical uh, properties that, they, that, that we, that's needed for the dynamical core, we're using a mixed finite element scheme um, so it's very different to the long lap grid, structured grid um, and a finite difference dynamic scheme. It's mixed finite elements uh, on, on, on this unstructured mesh. Um, and so we have different fields live on different spaces and they have different representations um, that might be on 
uh, nodes or edges, uh, sorry, yeah, edges or faces or cell centers, etc. Um, so I'm going to talk about solvers now um, because this is the, the big part of the dynamics apart from advection. So if we solve the advection problem by having an unstructured mesh, so I don't have to do lots of communication around the poles, the other big piece of the communication comes from doing the solver and the dynamics. So um, we need to do a solver and solvers are a particular uh, mathematical method for solving them called Krylov subspace solvers. Uh, basically, we have a matrix which represents the the problem, the the differential equations we have to solve, and they operate on a vector of data. And so, the vector of data, the starting point is B. Uh, we have to have solve A X equals B. So we have to find X. And that is the update we need to do. Um, and the solvers work by uh, build an improved solution based on the previous one so they're iterative the compute they have a compute intensive matrix times vector this is the linear operator it's part of the sub part of the subspace for the Krylov subspace that we're using and then we need to do scalars computed from the norms of these vectors so to compute the scalar the norm of a vector we have to do a global sum mpi or reduce if i can do fewer iterations i can do fewer global sums and I have to do, I use that using something to precondition this matrix so I have to do less work to actually actually solve it. So in LFREC, uh, we have this uh, structure where we have an iterative solver, which can be any number of the algorithms we want to pick. Uh, the iterative solver has an operator, which is the problem we have to solve. It can have a preconditioner and a vector of data it's going to operate on. This is a very common abstraction. Um, I've seen in other libraries like Petsy or Trilinios, um, and so we are using it in Alfric as well. Um, and we can then have this nested solver that we end up with, um, where the preconditioner for the outer solve is in fact uh, the pressure solve itself. Um, so this structure allows us for the easy implementation of a sophisticated nested solver. Uh, we're going to use the mu a multi-grid preconditioner to reduce the work for the iterative soldier solver because this is a, both, both faster and uses less global sums, so it gives us better scaling, which is what I'm going to show you. Um, okay, oh, that's come out. Sorry, that's rendered uh, quite horribly. Um, I will go back and redraw, re-render that for you. So if you want to go back and reread it, I can. But basically, uh, is a paper uh, that's just been accepted in the in the quarterly journal, the Royal Meteorological Society. There's the DOI. So basically, we want to solve the problem on this mesh here, and we do it by coarsening the mesh several times, solving it here, and then coming back to this mesh. So this is the multi-grid method. Um, Um, okay, so we can look at then doing different methods and how much do they cost. So this was running on something called a C92 cube sphere, so that's about 50 kilometer resolution, running on uh, 64 nodes of the Met Office Cray XC40. So again, this is mixed mode, open MP, MPI. So it's just worth noting that um, all the results for Elfric, um, all the parallel code was generated with Cyclone using this DSL. So no, we didn't write any MPI, we didn't write any OpenMP, we used the, the Cyclone to generate all that code. Um, uh, and so this is the DSL in action um, and because it works so well, we you, we kind of don't even have to think about it anymore. Um, so that's so that's that's really good. So this, this code uses the DSL that we were talking about this morning. Um, so you can see if you use the Krylov subspace solver and you solve to different tolerances, it takes the tighter the tolerance, the longer it takes. So you've got the total time and then in blue is the inner inner solve. Um, and then you can look at the time taken for different levels of multigrid and then you can do just using the multigrid pre uh, uh, as the solver. And then you can look at doing the multigrid as the preconditioner and then doing the Krylov subspace solve on top. So this is the fastest, the multigrid. Um, and so if you look at the fall in the residual compared to the Krylov subspace for doing multigrid, that looks like a solver to 10 to the minus 2 tolerance. And so we're going to look at that before and after multigrid with a three level B cycle because that appears to be the fastest. 
Okay, so if we do that, okay, so I'm going to run it on uh, a C1152 mesh, so that's a 1152-1152 per panel with six panels for the cube sphere, 30 levels. That's roughly a nine kilometer global resolution. Uh, so this is running the dynamics only. The 400, run for 400 time steps. Each time step is about 205 seconds. That gives us an acoustic CFL of about eight. Um, so this for, for this particular problem, we are probably okay with the CFL up to 16 maybe. Um, so we're not gonna violate CFL, but this is just a measure of the acoustic CFL to give us a, a rough size of what the equivalent time step will be for other problems. Okay, using the Intel 17 compiler, 60 MPI ranks per node, six open MP threads per rank, run on 384 nodes out to more than half the big machine. So that's 124,000 cores. Um, and so you can see that the data per parallel element goes from 24 squared times 30 levels down to eight squared times 30 levels. So the, here we are in the strong scaling regime. And we're gonna compare multi-grade three levels in a solve precondition only with Krylov subspace 10 to the minus 2 and Krylov subspace 10 to the minus 6. So we'll see quite a few uh, dramatic things. So the first up is if we look at the total solve, the semi-implicit solver, so this is for the outer solve, bottom, parallel, bottom panel shows parallel efficiency, one is perfect scaling. Uh, so you can see that scaling wise, mm, they don't scale that well, but they're okay. Um, if you look at the relative cost, you can see that multigrid is as much as 10 times faster than 10 to the minus, than 10, Krylov solvers 10 to the minus six, and maybe four or times, five times faster than um, solving for 10 to the minus two. Um, so the multigrid is much faster than both the Krylov subspace solvers. Uh, if we look at just the inner solve itself, the pressure solve, you can see here that here in blue is the parallel efficiency and you can see that the multigrid solver is, is showing really good parallel efficiency even up to three and a half thousand nodes or so 125,000 cores so that's really great. Where our subspace solvers really start to tail off. We'll see why that is in a minute and if you look at the relative performance you can see that the Krylov subspace solver for solving 10 to the minus 2 multigrid is about 10 times faster so that's a huge effect and if we were to solve it 10 to the minus 6 it's a whopping 25 times faster so that's a huge huge algorithmic efficiency for for multigrid as well as the scaling um, if you look at the communication costs you can see so this is the amount of times communications per time step so you've got multi-grid kr2 kr6 so you can see that as we scale out the amount of local communication so mpi send and receive uh, reduces as we go to the strong scaling regime but uh, if we look at the global sums we can see a really dramatic effect so here's the amount of time we're taking for the Krylov subspace solvers for doing the global sums and it's huge compared to the multi-grid that's right down there, and the re which is really, really tiny. And the reason is, is because we're just not doing them. Um, the algorithm doesn't use the, 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 the multigrid. Okay, so apparently I've only got five minutes, so um, it also helps with CFL, so I'm just going to skip over that. Um, a little bit about redundant computation, so um, we can do more compute and less communication. Um, so, for example, if we have... Uh, four MPI ranks uh, and we split the data up like this each of these have got a header to solve whereas if I do a mixed mode code uh, here's my uh, whole MPI region I've got more halo because the whole thing's bigger but I'm splitting it across four so if I do redundant communication with open redundant computation with open MP and calculate in the halo rather than communicate in the halo then with open MP I have less work to do than I would with MPI and I've got less communication Okay, and that's what we see here. So as I increase the number of threads, um, so one open MP thread is just doing it with pure MPI, and here nine open MP threads is four MPI ranks per nodes, each with nine open MP threads, and you can see that the matrix vector scales 
just nicely the amount of resources fixed is just choosing the right algorithm for, for better scaling. Um, and then we can do some more things to produce uh, the, the communication. This is all done with Cyclone. It's a transformation in Cyclone called Alex DOS to uh, reduce the number of header exchanges. So that was what I was going to say about scaling. Um, I have got some slides very quickly about GPUs, which I'm just going to um, uh, just going to quick through quickly, but I'm about to run out of time. So GPUs are much harder to program because they have distinct memory spaces. We have to think about data transfer and synchronization, instruction level parallelism, parallel hierarchy, uh, symmetric multi-threaded processes, and threads, and we need to also subscribe concurrency. More threads than cores. Okay, so we exploited data parallelism in the horizontal for CPUs. Dynamics tends to have limit, limited data dependency in the vertical. Um, so we could look at doing this, uh, this, this, this SIMT for GPUs across the vertical degrees of freedom, but you want quite a lot of levels, 128 plus, but that's probably about the right number. Vert physics kernels tend to have dependency in the vertical, but they tend to have extra degrees of freedom. For example, radiation bands that we could use to loop across to use all this parallelism. Um, you can try and exploit the CPU and GPU together, but that's quite hard to synchronize, and it's probably simpler to reduce the data movement compute on the GPU only. I did have some slides about the data layout in Elfric, but I'm going to skip over that because I'm going to run out of time. Um, here's some work that was done by NVIDIA looking at an Elfric kernel and doing just not changing the code, but just using OpenMP instructions to increase the way the parallelism is used. And as you can see, as you increase the amounts of parallelism you're exploiting, the code goes faster on the GPU. Um, but they're very complicated things, so it's it's really about organizing the code in a different way um, and, and you need much more data to exploit uh, that parallelism in a GPU. Um, so, okay, I'm going to just leave that there. Um, that's some work done by the University of Manchester, Mike Ashworth, exporting the code to the, onto an FPGA. I don't have any time to about that. So I'm just going to go straight to my conclusions then. So the end of the free lunch, there are no faster processors. There has been no faster processors since 2005. We just have to exploit ever more parallelism. The mathematics of the problem dictates what can be computed in parallel. The choice of how to solve that mathematics of weather and climate, uh, we have a choice of how to do that for weather and climate, and those uh, choices lead to different parallel algorithms and their implementations. But there's an interplay between the implementation and the parallel algorithm we use to solve. Um, and this leads to different scaling of algorithmic components of the time steps. Newer architectures require exploitation of more parallelism, so we have to uh, rethink this process again and think about how we're going to exploit this parallelism. And then the tools like the DSLs we saw this morning are a way of helping us to be able to do that. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and take any questions.